Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural RPE University Women in Energy webinar, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Cheryl Martin, the Acting Director of RPE, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we begin and I introduce our guests, I want to attend to some administrative details and provide you with some background for those of you who may be unfamiliar with RPE or RPE University. Presentation slides and a video recording of today's webinar will be available on the RPE website within the next week. The format of today's webinar is a 35-minute discussion follow about, followed by Q&A. You can ask a question through the Q&A dialog box on your screen. Should you encounter any technical difficulties during the course of this webinar, you can also request assistance using the chat function on your screen and somebody will be back to you to help. So let me jump in with a little bit about RPE. RPE stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency of Energy. Here at RPE, we catalyze the advancement of transformational energy technologies to enhance the economic and energy security of the United States. We do this by investing in high potential, high impact energy projects that are too early for private sector. You can learn more about this at www.arpa-e.energy.gov. The RPE University is a webinar series we offer to provide the energy technology community with expert insight and practical information to help transition innovations to the marketplace. Our RPE University webinars have fallen into distinct categories. Technology, where we discuss deep dives into specific energy technologies. Technology to market webinars, where we discuss salient topics and commercialization, such as licensing your technology, effective negotiation, and dealing with next stage uh, partners in your development. Office hours webinars have offered expertise on a broad range of topics led by our program directors. And finally, our newest Women in Energy series is intended to engage women researchers, technologists, engineers, and entrepreneurs working in the energy industry and provide them with a constructive and supportive forum to discuss a variety of salient issues, hearing from technologists and leaders across the entire spectrum of energy. And so, again, welcome to this first of uh, Women in Energy series. I'm really excited to greet a special guest to kick off the discussion today. Deputy Secretary of Energy, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, who was sworn in just last week. She brings a wealth of experience in the national security realm, having served in the White House since 2009 and working as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in a previous administration. And I'm so glad she was able to make some time in this really first week of her being on board to, uh, to join us for just a, a few minutes today. Uh, Deputy Secretary? Hello, Cheryl, and hello to all the women on the line. I thank you for including me in this launch and for all the great work you're doing, both to stimulate innovation in the energy sector and to inspire women in energy. It's very exciting to be here, and as you noted, this is uh, now my sixth day on the job. I've been so warmly welcomed by the department and especially by the impressive women who work here. It's very important to me, to Secretary Moniz, and to President Obama to open doors for women in science, technology, engineering, and math careers. From a national and indeed a global perspective, we have to tap into the full talent pool available to us. And I just note that that's something that frankly wasn't the case when I began my career in the national security field. Uh, Indeed, at that time, men had doubts about whether women could be relied on to handle things like nuclear strategy. We've come a long way since then, but we also have a lot farther to go. And that's why I'm fully committed to cultivating the next generation of young women who will become leaders in science and technology. I look forward to meeting a number of you in the course of doing my job over the coming weeks and months. And unfortunately, I have to hop off this call for another meeting or I'd love to listen to your discussion today. So thank you for letting me join me and for all the work you're doing. Your efforts will make a big difference in the lives of the women you help. And in so doing, you will make our country stronger and safer. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. 
Thanks, Deputy Secretary. I'm pleased to have you with us and hope you can join us in a future webinar. Um, at this point in time, um, I wanted to give special thanks and recognition to Dr. Dolly Cheetah. Jo Dolly is a principal investigator on an ARPA-E-funded project. She's been a dedicated proponent of women in energy and a constant and engaging presence at the RPE annual Women in Energy Breakfast. She actually came to me just, just about a year ago at this summit um, with the idea for this series, and we're thrilled to be able to make it happen. So thank you, Dolly. I know you're out there listening, and I uh, look forward again to engaging with you and your colleagues uh, to move your projects for further. Uh, now, without further ado, I want to welcome our two accomplished and esteemed guests. Dr. Anne Lee Carlin, the president of the, um, the Association for Women in Science, also known as AWIS, and a senior vice president at Genentech, as well as Eileen Pollack, a professor at the University of Michigan and author of the 2013 New York Times Magazine article, Why Are There Still So Few Women in Science? So why don't we jump right in? Um, Anne, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to join today in today's conversation, very important conversation. So as a quick background, um, thank you, Cheryl. I'd like to just uh, mention that uh, as um, Senior Vice President at Genentech, I lead portfolio management and operations for our R&D division, overseeing over 35 drug development teams um, for our biotech company, and we do focus on uh, serious and life-threatening diseases such as cancer and autoimmune diseases. Uh, my quick background is that I have a PhD in bioengineering and also uh, an MBA from Stanford University. So I um, have really been fortunate to find a, a perfect blend of uh, very deep science and also uh, business, and, and that is uh, the role that I play in much of my daily life. Uh, for today's conversation, we'd definitely love to touch a bit on what we do at Genentech but primarily focus on my role as president and chair of the board of directors for the Association for Women in Science, AWIS. Uh, very I'm very proud to represent uh, this um, association. I'll, I'll give it just a really quick background. AWIS is the largest multidisciplinary organization for women in STEM, and we have over 50 chapters and affiliates across the nation, including major chapters in Boston, Washington, D.C., San Francisco Bay Area, San Diego, Texas, New York, uh, and, and many, many other uh, states. Um, AWIS has a very rich history and a very successful track record of advancing women's leadership in STEM. We were awarded, the association was awarded the Presidential Mentoring Award from the White House and currently uh, holds a, a partnership, uh, actually ongoing partnership, uh, multiple years, with the National Science Foundation. Uh, we've developed programs with the NSF to partner with uh, major disciplinary societies to increase recognition for women and minorities in STEM, and also to help with uh, developing systemic approaches to increase the representation of, of women leaders in STEM. Um, we also work very closely with our corporate partners, such as Genentech and Metamune and others, and we very recently initiated a new collegiate rep program with many of our academic partners, including Duke, uh, Penn, Case Western, Stanford, many, many others, uh, so that we can reach out and provide uh, what we hope will be really valuable resources and networking for uh, young women developing and training in the sciences and engineering, as well as uh, very accomplished uh, senior women who uh, continue to make an impact in our fields. And I'll stop there, Cheryl. Excellent. Thanks so much, Anne, for, uh, for kicking off that piece of this. I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Sure. I, I'm not only honored to be here, I'm completely intimidated because um, all of you are the women that I grew up wanting to be and then didn't become. I, I grew up in the uh, 60s and early 70s in uh, upstate New York wanting very much to be an astrophysicist, um, but it was sort of the bad old days, and I because I was a girl, I wasn't allowed to take the advanced courses in science and math. Um, I was told it was because women don't go on in science and math, so I would only be wasting the seat in the class. Um, I, I somehow got myself to Yale anyway, but um, there were no women major. No women had ever majored in physics, and um, 
I was way, way behind all the guys and uh, always the only woman in the class. Um, I worked very, very hard to catch up, and by uh, senior year, I was pretty much the top of my class. I had done all sorts of research, both practical and theoretical. I had done an internship, actually, in energy at Oak Ridge, um, and then I just walked away from physics. I was burnt out. Uh, No one ever said, are you going to go on in this? So I it was this common with many young women. I took that as a sign that I they thought I wasn't qualified. If if I were qualified, they would have said that I should go on. Um, I was much more encouraged in my writing classes. I went on. Uh, first, I was a reporter, and then I um, studied fiction, and uh, I published novels, short stories, some nonfiction books. Occasionally, I wrote about a female scientist, but... Um, Mostly science was so painful for me that I I really tried not to have anything to do with it. But in 2005, when Larry Summers made his blooper of a question about why there weren't more women at high levels in physics, um, and he sort of suggested it might be because women uh, couldn't perform at the very highest end of the spectrum the way men could in science and math, or they weren't as dedicated. I know Larry Summers for years and years since we were both teenagers and I sat down to write him an email to explain why women didn't go on in physics that it had nothing to do with aptitude or diligence and the email got longer and longer until it grew into a book. I basically realized I didn't quite understand why I hadn't gone on. Um, So part of the book is an exploration into my own history. I went back and talked to my classmates, my professors. Um, I also studied the research about uh, women and science and math and I went uh, back to Yale and and to some other institutions to see what, if anything, had changed between my younger days and um, the lives of young women now to see why they still weren't going on in in any significant numbers. Um, And that ended up being a book. So the um, an excerpt from the book, as you said, came out uh, in the October 3rd 2013 edition of the New York Times Sunday Magazine section, and I was bowled over by the response because actually I hadn't been able to interest anyone in the book and barely could get the article published. So the response was really amazing. Um, And the book version is going to come out uh, in September of next year. Uh, The book version is called The Only Woman in the Room, Why Science is Still a Boys Club. Uh, It's going to be out from Beacon Press. Um, So I will leave it there for now. No, thank you, Eileen. Well, we're glad that the uh, the path to uh, to science has uh, has found you again, and uh, like this <laughs> conversation with us today. Um, bouncing to a point you did make in your New York Times essay that the most powerful determinant of whether a woman goes on in science might be whether anyone encourages her um, was clearly something you heard from folks. Um, and maybe bounce the question over to you. Who, who encouraged you, and what have been, um, you know, the various role models and, and mentors that you've had as you've come through um, both PhD and uh, and MBA sides of things? Yes, I um, my you could say mentors and uh, supporters were literally close to home. My father uh, was an engineering professor. And my mother uh, was a math major, so uh, you know, science, engineering, math was a uh, integral part of our home life. <laughs> and uh, my father uh, really encouraged uh, both my brother and me, um, probably in some ways, you know, gender gender blind, to uh, really, you know, explore, get great in in math, to explore science. Uh, he would bring back calculators and. Or, you know, early computers, and I learned how to program a computer, uh, you know, at a fairly young age. So it was something that I was quite steeped in, and I think that's what I I think is quite striking is if, you know, if if you could say at the individual basis, you could build a culture in which it's natural for a girl or a boy um, to uh, you know continue to run and explore their natural curiosity with with the with the world um, that it it shouldn't feel insurmountable. And I felt that's what I experienced in many ways, and, and I was just encouraged to do that. The other thing, in, in, in a kind of a funny way, maybe for Eileen, is that I, in some ways, always wanted to be a writer <laughs> and never <laughs> never quite crossed that, that chasm 
Uh, but I, but what I did do was uh, really indulge in science fiction, uh, movies and books and everything, mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, maybe the real real world of science, but also the fantasy world of what science can can uh, do and, and what that alternative universe looks like. For me, that was incredibly inspirational, and that carried me through quite a bit in terms of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. When I think you speak to something, and very much, you know, that Eileen echoed, is the idea that a technology background can take you anywhere, right? I've given a few talks about that that whole idea that you have that technology background. And certainly, Eileen, it, it appeared in various things that you did write, right? You added in um, characters, and when you came back to the subject, you were credible in it because of your background. Um, how have you seen, Eileen, women who are majoring in STEM fields staying in and, and feeding their variety of interests, you know, as they've gone on to various career paths? How have you seen that playing out? Well, um, the women that I found uh, stayed in, went on. Um, I, I started to to notice patterns. Um, as Anne said, it, it, their their parents. It was often a father who encouraged them, um, a teacher somewhere along the way. Um, and then, I, I, as I said in the Times article, and I, I hope you'll excuse the profanity, but I'm just quoting it over and over. Women would just say, "Well, I was one of the women who didn't give a crap." I knew I wasn't supposed to do this. It, you know, I, I was supposed to dress a different way or be interested in other things or people were discouraging me and I'm just by nature someone who who just doesn't care. Um, I found that I could also start to predict how many women had gone to uh, single-sex um, middle schools, high schools, and colleges. And those were the women who said, I, I just don't understand what everybody else is talking about in terms of lacking confidence, needing encouragement, needing role models. And I would say, oh, did you go to an all-girl high school? And they'd say, yeah, how did you know? Um, so uh, the uh, – and, and I have to say that I didn't find too many women who were able to – combine a career in um, science with their other interests and that we're still losing a lot of women who feel that, that they're, they got the message early that, you know, especially if you're going to go on for your PhD, um, a little less so for industry, um, that if you were to do research, you really had to give up everything, um, every other, even going to the gym, not only because you were not supposed to have time for it, but because you were seen as less serious um, and uh, that was upsetting to me. Uh, some, it, it's less so in other countries, in other cultures. Uh, strangely enough, there are some cultures where women feel that they can still say knit during a, a presentation and still be taken seriously, but that's clearly not, not true in America. Um, so, yeah, I, I wish I could be more <laughs> optimistic but, uh, or, or positive about this, but I'm still seeing that as a... Um, as a rarity. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things I'm particularly excited about from RPE's perspective and from the idea of this series is to be able to highlight um, women in a variety of roles, like our own um, awardees and the various types of technologies they're pursuing, uh, both academics and industry. Because my own belief has always been, um, and I think I found it true in my own career, that to be able to have a role model somebody that is doing something that you can picture yourself like allows you to then get on board and figure out how to get over your own hurdles. Right. Because every, well, every I, I one of us in every generation has hurdles, but I think this whole excitement for me is that we do have a population of women who are out there in STEM who are engaged in this space. I think probably, Anne, you see that with, with AWIS and the folks at Genentech. And how do we help them connect and inspire um, to be that next, you know, that next role model and to have people ask questions or stay in the game because they picture themselves in that future. That's right. I, I do think role models are extremely, extremely powerful and important. I, I remember when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I was in the engineering program, there were very few women. I, I am actually pretty sure I did not have a woman engineering professor at the time. I do hope they, they fix that. And, uh, and one of the role models I ran into was at an uh, industry evening event in which the keynote speaker uh, was a woman entrepreneur who had started her own computer science firm, uh, also held a PhD and an MBA, and uh, seemed uh, 
really confident and in her vision of what she was trying to create. And it was the first time I ever ran into uh, someone who sounded like that and, and, and seemed incredibly accomplished and also seemed to be someone who was willing to take risks and actually did not have all the answers that day. And, and I, you know, I still remember her, and this is, I was probably 19 at the time. And, uh, and you know, throughout my own you know, career, I've certainly run into uh, very uh, talented and uh, accomplished and powerful women. Uh, you know, you may know that uh, the president of product development at uh, Genentech uh, was Sue uh, Hellman, who is also, uh, who's now the CEO of the Gates Foundation. And uh, I spent many years um, interacting and, and admiring her leadership. So I, I think the role models really open your eyes to what you can do. And, and, you, and for individual women, I feel that you can set your sights even higher, higher than you ever thought. I would say, too, that not only do you see, if there's a role model that you see you can do that thing, you can picture yourself in that role, but if it's, if, if it's a role model who says you don't have to accept the status quo as the only way um, this field can be, it, it's, it's very empowering. So um, even in, in writing, I had a, a professor who, um, I was not going to have children because I couldn't envision how I could do that and still have my career, and she said, oh, no, no, children are a great part of life. They'll make you more creative. And, um, and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I had them. You know, that you can, um, if you find the right mentor, uh, she might m make it clear that just because other people are saying you can't lead a, a complete or a healthy lifestyle or do, do what you want to do, be who you want to be, and still be a, a good, uh, excellent scientist, once you get that in your head, that just because the system is the, seems to be the way it is or people are saying you have to do certain things and can't do others, that you can just say, well, that's fine for you, but that's not how I'm going to do it. I think that makes a huge difference, too, in the lives of, um, of younger women coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things, again, that I, I'm very supportive of is having a broad network of just people – that you interact with, peers, uh, people older than you, people up and coming, because I think, to your point, there's places where different styles are workable in places, different types of roles are workable in different places, but if you're looking for some guidance, it has to make sense, right? If somebody says, um, sure, just be brave, well, you're standing there and, you know, and your knees are shaking, you know, there's days where you need somebody who can emphasize, emphasize with you, but other days you need that person that's just going to put their hand on your back and say, go forth, right? Right. So I'm interested from both of you, how have you expanded your range of your network? And is it something that you work on actively all the time? One thing I hear from women sometimes is, well, I don't have time to build my network. And I was like, well, you don't, you're not going to have more time the day it's a crisis. So how have you guys thought about networking as part of this broad mentoring and, and giving, you know, voice to um, the, the broad range of things that are possible? Yeah, I'm, uh, this is Ann. I'm happy to jump in. I think uh, networking has been a huge part of my um, professional and personal development. And in some ways it sort of just um, – uh, move seamlessly into uh, daily or weekly conversations with people. You know, sometimes you're having a conversation and you may not even realize you're networking. Uh, for me, I'm, and then I'm guessing as for many women in science and engineering, I I love to learn and I love to learn from others. And some of the best advice that I got from a mentor, uh, a male mentor here, uh, one of our uh, our chief medical officer recently, um, he always uh, taught me that you can learn anything from anyone. And um, I feel that uh, people who are naturally curious, again, a lot of scientists are this way, will, will want to reach out and, and share ideas with other people. Part of it is just that's the way you do science, is that uh, I think it's rarely that we are sitting in our office alone, I hope not, uh, or a lab alone. And, uh, and that natural connection helps you develop not only ideas that are very content-oriented, but also um, you know, learn what you can do with your training. and uh, I am a big fan. I know, Cheryl, you mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, young students, uh, in anyone who uh, want to make STEM as part of their tra training. Um, some or many of them will become scientists and engineers, but many can become 
uh, writers or in politics and law and medicine. I just personally find STEM an incredibly powerful foundation for a thinking person. And, uh, and I think part of networking is the, is the way to build yourself to find which paths are you going to take. Maybe one quick point about um, you know, time for networking. Um, I am also, I, I think Eileen had mentioned, had children. I, I also now have two children, and I do find it harder to find time for networking, but it really comes down now to prioritization. What are the right. one or two or a few more meetings? What are the top meetings that you're going to go to that year and just prioritize, plan way ahead? Um, this I'm going to say is maybe partly uh, humorously, but I think it's quite real. I have some really terrific friends and colleagues who are incredible networkers, and I often, uh, we often laugh. I would say that because I'm, I have limited time, I will network with them, and they will help me amplify my effect. So it's always helpful to network with people who are natural hubs. Well, yeah, I, I also think that, that there, the advantages are there never used to be so many. Or there, there are now starting to be organizations of women in different STEM fields. Uh, I was just this summer at a, a wonderful conference for an international conference for women physicists up in Waterloo, Ontario, and there were women from all over the world. It doesn't happen very often, but you meet somebody, you you see, make a face-to-face -face connection. And that may get you through three years of sort of very brief email contact. Um, you know, we didn't used to have uh, the Internet to, to stay in touch in a relatively, you know, easy, brief way. And I think sometimes all you need is just, oh, yeah, that person I met, and here's a quick email because so I need a shot of support about this or advice about that, um, and, and just, um, you know, maintaining both the real and the virtual uh, connections that way, and then I try to um, make networks among my students um, so that they will sort of almost grow up <laughs> with with these networks of you know three or five people that they feel they can go to um, at at different times when they need help. Um, but yep. you know, most of this didn't exist in the past, so I, I think this is something I am really optimistic about that um, women scientists didn't used to have this mechanism um, to stay in touch and to take advantage of, yep. of you know, communities like this. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one important thing, you know, people, you know, recognizing exactly your point, Eileen, that once you make a connection with somebody, if you see something about that person, you drop them a two-line note, hey, saw your new article on your, you know, on your new research, uh, you know, published, that was awesome. It's like those types of things keep that network alive. It doesn't right. have to be this. this it can be a one device. minute, right? Right, a one minute investment. I, I think also that connections um, from generation to generation are really valuable too. For example, uh, since you know, I notice in my younger colleagues, whether in science or any other field, there's just such an intense. The culture has become so the, the notion of femininity and parenthood, and you know, being the ideal parent and having some crazy elaborate wedding. And, I mean, it's just way different than it was when I was young. And just reminding some of my younger colleagues that, well, no, you don't actually have to grow your child's food from scratch and make it complete. You know, that that you can cut a whole bunch of corners and still have a kid who turns out great. Um, just to give perspective, um, you know, sometimes to, to have connections to people of different generations in your field can be very valuable, too. Yeah. One thing I think about um, that we forget sometimes is that every person we meet, be they our peer today in the lab at the bench when we're in grad school or somebody we work with, everyone's career is developing at the same time. So that person that sits next to you today is going to go off and they're going to do their own awesome thing. And being able to, you won't anticipate where they're going to go and where you're going to go right from the beginning. But to maintain those connections gives you a, a pretty valuable network over time. It's sort of a, sort of like investing in your bank account, right? It just grows because you and it are growing over time. Right. I, I also have to say that I think the single most potent factor for change that I'm seeing is simple awareness of First of all, you know, I'm not, you know, somebody's thinking, okay, I'm not crazy that this is so hard, seems so much harder for me than, say, for my male colleagues. And there's sort of unacknowledged bias and there's studies that document this or that, you know, the system is stacked this way or that way. That 
as soon as women figure out that it's not them, that this is not like just, oh, something's wrong with me, I'm seeing them come back to jobs and programs they had abandoned, fight harder, get tougher. Um, and and I think the the most potent way, really, to make people aware of what they are battling against at this more hidden subliminal level is networking, um, showing people, you know, showing each other studies and um, articles and, you know, look at this on Twitter. And again, you, you might not need more than five minutes to glance at an article or, or to see somebody's email to know, oh, right, it's not me. And and I think that's really the most potent change, both at the individual level and and, and a larger level of changing the institutions. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. love what you're touching on, Eileen, which is in many ways, uh, you know, people use different words for it, but both the intrinsic and the extrinsic aspects of moving one's um, science and career forward, right? So you're touching on the extrinsic, which I think quite quite a few, uh, there's been more and more research right now, and I know that's what you touched on in your in your article, but, you know, we, we kind of frame it as, you know, what does a leader look like? What does a scientist look like? I, I think right. that there's been such a narrow definition of that in the past, you know, especially leadership skills. It, uh, must sound uh, loud or chest beating, et cetera. And, and I think that uh, as more and more people have this the social and technology platform to share these articles and research, the the more quickly we can all educate ourselves about the sort of systemic, whether whether intentional or not, but systemic um, sort of challenges that we have, as well as intrinsic, mm-hmm. right, which is to really encourage, uh, you know, women scientists and leaders to, uh, you know, continually – uh, strengthen their skills and and to be the best leaders that they can. There's right. a, there's an intrinsic part of what you can control, but I think the extrinsic is what I've been extremely happy to see as as growing in the mainstream conversation. It's just things that some people knew, but now it's become much much more um, uh, widely known. And I think it's right. a really important and part of the public engagement and the public education about the systemic challenges that might still exist. And and I would say let's not you know it it I see this with men too is that you know most of the men are very eager to see more women in their fields and they're just totally baffled like where are they why don't they want to do this and when they see the chart of of the implicit bias say that Joe Handelsman's study uncovered right. they gasp I mean they're just like oh oh, yes. that was oh my god you know and it's there. this is science and so they believe it. And they, they're, it, it's really kind of remarkable how many of them, especially, of course, the, some of the younger men, but some of the older ones, too, once they believe it and understand it and can kind of get how it works, they will then actually encourage a woman or be careful that they're not waiting, you know, choosing the male candidate just because he has a male name. Um, well, so, yeah, it works with men as well as women. Yeah, I'm so sorry. What's fascinating about the Joe Handelsman, uh, the Yale article, is that um, it was really both women and men, right, right. who uh, uh, I guess fell into uh, the uh, discriminating bias, against the bias, which is yeah. you know mm-hmm. having sort of different standards uh, based on what what you know one perceived as the gender of the applicant, and and again, women and men often can yeah. fall into those Absolutely. cognitive traps, which I think is something that you know. I, uh, several of us at AWIS at, on our board of directors often call, you know, it'd be so aspirational to move from unconscious bias to conscious awareness. Wouldn't it be great if right. women and men were all, all able to call out when we each see each other falling into those cognitive, you know, sort of pitfalls, those traps? Yeah, but I think we open everyone. up the dialogue. Well, we, sorry, Ann, I was going to say we open up the dialogue so much more when we acknowledge that it can happen broadly. And that it is part of being human is to have some of these these tendencies so that we need to be aware of it and be comfortable enough to call each other on it. Right. Or to call ourselves on it. I, You know, yeah, yeah. since I became aware of all this, I see myself doing it all the time, which is kind of yeah. horrifying. But, um, you know, you can catch yourself and you, you can catch other people, too, of course. Yeah, one mm-hmm. of the things it's scarier that, when you catch yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of the things that I've caught myself on, and, and it's something that um, AWIS did uh, with, a, with a partnership with NSF, I kind of mentioned it really brief, briefly before, is this idea of the language of leadership, which is that very, very well-meaning uh, professionals, uh, so scientists, 
people writing letters of recommendation. So, you know, when you write a letter of recommendation, most people want to write a positive letter of recommendation. But right. What, te- what tends to creep in, which has been well studied, is, uh, you know, uh, a tendency, at least in the past, of using words like brilliant and risk-taking, you know, maybe more mm-hmm. from a male app- you know, applicant versus, you know, hardworking, you know, collaborative, which are all great. And in fact, you know, when we look for leaders, we look for leaders with all those sort of adjectives or attributes. But uh, if you don't watch out, you know, you can fall again into um, inadvertent stereotyping, and that does affect the selection process. Whether right. hiring, yeah. promotion, uh, recognition for scholarly awards, and, and that's, again, very well documented. It's something that we're trying to build in to our um, sort of talent management process, at least on, on our side in the company, and mm-hmm. I think it would be really wise for societies as well. Absolutely. And maybe, Anne, you could speak to that a little bit, uh, what at Genentech you're doing, some, some really interesting new initiatives to make sure you do attract and retain a very diverse set of talent. Yes, definitely. So, you know, Genentech, we, you know, I, I think, again, we have probably a years of history of really priding ourselves to be, in, and we quote, we quote, great, great place to work. Uh, over the past few years, uh, a number of senior leaders have started, uh, you know, one of several sort of efforts. One of them is called Genentech Women in Science and Engineering, GYs for short. And uh, we've really focused on several areas. You know, one area is what I call, you know, the development of the intrinsic skills, which is the leadership skills. We have um, provided really top-level training, leadership communication, decision-making, uh, have panel discussions for, you know, peer-to-peer interaction, and then we invite very senior leaders, such as CEOs, women CEOs of uh, entrepreneurial companies. Another area that we uh, focus on uh, is um, education. I mean, we touched on it a little bit here for, you know, one of several examples is that uh, we've invited uh, some top researchers, professors from the Stanford Clayman Institute of Gender Research to come and share some of this research in a very objective way, very data-driven way, so that we can all understand, you know, what, a, you know, what, it, what happens <laughs> to human beings when we make these, you know, shortcuts and, and, uh, and, uh, and think that we're making pattern recognition, but we really may not be doing ourselves a good a service in terms of finding and retaining talent. And then an, another area is that we really, when I say we, we male and uh, uh, female senior leaders have really understood that engaging men, engaging men, male leaders throughout the company is extremely important. Uh, right. We, we know that it, this really, at the end of the day, can't just be an effort that's sort of in one corner of the company and really doesn't engage uh, all the decision makers, right, throughout the company, whether it's who to hire, who to promote, et cetera. So, we know that engaging both men and women are very important, and we have um, we have a lot of efforts going in that way too. So that's pretty quick highlights, but those are areas in which uh, we feel that we can make some progress and also overcome yeah. some of the uh, maybe sort of the, the uh, unintended consequences if you, if you don't really educate yourself. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's good for people to have you know some real life examples of what are companies actually out there trying to do. So uh, really uh, applaud across across Genentech that effort because you said it affects everybody and it makes mm-hmm. it makes the whole company better right and that really is our goal right how how can we make the innovation process the generation of knowledge and science better and uh, not only the US but the world better because we certainly have uh, our share of challenges in it that need to be overcome um, I was going to um, I was going to switch to questions in just a minute we're at the 35 minute mark here. We got about 20 minutes left. So I was going to encourage folks to send Q&A in. We're seeing some start to bounce in um, in the box on the side of your screen for Q&A. Um, and as we're just waiting for one or two more to come in, um, maybe just a framing of what do you think are some of the ways we can create networks, real and virtual, to continue to help women in STEM? Are there things that you um, are aware of from AWIS's efforts or other um, other groups? You know what? I think I lost the last part. Could you repeat the last part of it? The w- ways we can create networks, either real or virtual, among women uh, in STEM. Yeah, so for um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, we're using AWIS. 
so I had mentioned earlier that we have uh, quite a number of, of chapters and affiliates, so uh, nothing really beats face-to-face -face, um, interactions. And uh, since I'm in the Bay Area, I'll use Palo Alto examples. So at Stanford campus, Palo Alto, uh, uh, an incredible volunteer effort of uh, n networking, uh, mentoring. I know we touched on mentoring. Mentoring is a, a very important part of um, our encouragement of how uh, people can transfer skills and experiences between people. We're, and and there, you may know that there might be a difference between mentoring and sponsoring as well, which is really sponsors being actively, um, you know, uh, identifying or putting their reputation on the line to to identify people to uh, take on stretch assignments. Um, so those mentoring and sponsoring for AWIS people. Virtually, we are uh, very much on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn uh, in terms of uh, a a pretty high throughput and also not too time consuming way of, of staying in touch. And, and I think both of you, Cheryl and Eileen, have mentioned that those are terrific ways, and, and that could, there are many other mm -hmm. platforms too, of course, to share articles, to share ideas, to applaud each other's successes, yes. to recognize and congratulate. So uh, those are terrific. And we also have uh, publications and, and webinars such as this. I, I, I think that these webinars can be extremely effective in terms of sharing ideas and then inviting interaction. Right. right. I, I I tend to be more involved at a, at a much earlier level of trying to get girls, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school girls sort of connected to people who will make them excited about um, the opportunities for women in science and, and ways that they can sort of network with each other and then have support as they move up, you know, through through something that, you know, the rocky points where we tend to lose women um, you know, as they go into sort of calculus and more advanced courses or freshman year when they get blown away in a big physics class or first year of um, PhD. Um, so those those tend to be some of the networks I'm seeing more of. But, um, you know, certainly within the university, we're seeing a lot more of, um, you know, like all the women in a, a chemistry department will have lunch together, you know, once every couple of months or even once a year. And, and that's happening in a way that it didn't used to be happening um, that right. I think is very effective. No, that's um, all very true. Well, we've got some good questions in. Are you guys ready to bounce to some questions from the uh, the audience? Sure. sure. Uh, actually, well, the first one was, was a reference, actually. Um, they wanted to know about the Joe Handelsman uh, implicit bias reference that we alluded to. I believe that that was Joe, J-O-H-A-N-D-E-D-L-E-S-M-A-N, was uh, Proceedings of the National Academy from September 2012. Is that right, Correct. Eileen? Yes. Yep. Um, okay. Yes. So we can post that onto our slides when we go to post them up for anybody who wants the whole reference. But if you're just Googling it, um, you'll be able to find it under Handelsman National Academy, September 2012. Really, really interesting article. Um, so... We had a question about, um, we see women primarily in two strata, top-level leadership roles over age 40 and entry-level roles under 30. Is there, do you see a gap in between those two age groups, and how can women move from one to the other? I could say it's just like me and get old, but I'm probably not going to satisfy anybody, huh? That's uh <laughs> You know, and that would be more for you. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, in some ways, I'm probably thinking about our, you know, our company's uh, experience, and also what I know about um, quite a few companies as well. There tends to be, at least in, I'd say, biotech, and maybe this is true across the board. There tends to be more of a nearly a 50/50 entry. Now, I know I, I've been reading the articles just as all of you have about Google and others, and I come from an engineering background. I guess, I guess you would just have that maybe in some of the engineering companies. But uh, at entry, uh, at least sort of life sciences biotech, it's pretty even. Um, it's really when you start getting to the higher director or you could say officer level. I know it's defined a little differently everywhere, but I think classically for the Fortune 500 companies, it's really when you start hitting vice president and above, and certainly when you hit the uh, chief, sort of the C-suite as it were, um, it drops up dramatically. And so... While I, I do think that there's sort of the early training career and then there's the after 40, the crucial inflection points, you know, my personal belief is in that 
you know, your, you know, the director heading toward the officer senior leader roles. And I've been puzzling, mm -hmm. a lot of us have been puzzling over that. Why is it, does it drop off? And it drops off almost on every area, you know, whether you're talking about going for a vice president, uh, CEOs of pretty major companies, or also board membership. I mean, board membership is what, still 4% maybe for most Fortune yeah. 500? I mean, that's so incredibly sparse. It's just terrible. So uh, I, I think it's, you know, a number of us think that it is back to the extrinsic intrinsic. Uh, maybe there are some women opting out. I'm starting to believe more and more it's really how we uh, select uh, people for stretch assignments, how visible okay. uh, women leaders are, and who is sponsoring them. Who, right. is, because for both men and women yeah. of any any accomplishment, it is often who reaches reaches out and pulls you into a really you know, tough assignment and, and gives you a break, basically. And, and that's always, that's always. Well, what takes what a chance on you, right? It's it takes a chance. Also, so who will, you, who's willing to put in, I think it's also who's willing to put in for and go after the high stress assignment. So, I mean, this is kind yeah. of anecdotal, but yeah. my impression, having spoken to a lot of women, is that we may be losing people in the middle, you know, who say this isn't worth it for me, I have children, it's just too stressful, and and, and they say it's my choice, I'm going to stay home or take an easier assignment or go into a different job right. that's less stressful. And it's, it's, it's not actually the uh, cause that it gets pinned on. So if there are all these sort of subliminal you know, behind the – they're not quite registering or, or being um, – uh, measured the the differentials between what a man and a woman would be having to put up with, um, and and it feels harder to the woman, but she doesn't know why. First of all, you can think, well, I'm just not as good at this as the guy in the next cubicle, but it's also the the one more thing you get handed, especially if that. I mean, the way I, I tend to put it is, if you were at the gym and you were on a treadmill next to a guy, and you thought the treadmills were set at the same level, but you're a lot tired and sweating a lot more than the guy, you know, after a while, you're just like, There's, why am I doing this? There's something wrong with me. You don't get that, you know, the resistance level on your machine has been set higher. And then you're handed, you know, a baby or something, and yours is heavier than, you know, the one that's handed to the guy. Um, you're going to drop off the treadmill, and and use right. as an excuse the last thing that happened, <laughs> but that may not be the actual cause. And so I think again, really trying to bring forward the stressors, the differentials in bias and in resources that people get, and and who's being put up for certain awards and what kind of assignments are people, you know, really mm -hmm. making as much of that aware to everybody um, that we might not lose people in the middle to, you know. Um, and, and people saying it's oh it's my choice when it yeah you know, right. but why well, I think are you making one thing that choice? That's really important is um, the whole idea that um, dealing with the realities of the workplace. I tell everybody when you think about career development that you need to work for as many people as possible as early as you can, and that may not be as a direct boss, but taking the opportunity to do an extra assignment or take the opportunity to um, work on a team with somebody because at some point the broader number of sponsors you have and the time when they get to weigh in on people, the more people who know you, the more likely you are to be able to be put forward and overcome some of those biases. And I think people sometimes um, feel very loyal to the person that they work with and it feels safe and, and comfortable, but I think that it does have a downside that at some point it is about who speaks up for you and who's willing to speak to your skills. I think, Anne, you spoke to this earlier, the idea of what are what are the leadership skills you need and to test that with, with men and women who are in that next layer above you. What are the real skills? And push people to define it in terms of skills that they need to demonstrate so you can get away from the softer language that can sometimes um, harbor some, uh, some issue. Absolutely. Maybe two quick... Uh Two quick thoughts, both both uh, building on Cheryl and Eileen, what you're saying. So, um, so one is, uh, you know, again, this this idea of of uh, sponsorship. It is really, if you if one thinks about it, you know, who is going to vouch for you? Who is going to bring up your name when you are not in the room? 
I, I think mm-hmm. that yeah. it, it isn't so easy to visualize that, but it really is. You know, the conversation is you're you're not in the room, so who is going to who is going to speak up for you? I think that's extremely important to think about. Um, the other one, uh, Eileen, and and I guess I'll just throw in my own, I guess, anic- personal anecdote is, it's not it is not easy uh, when we're all running on those treadmills uh, and and these these assignments uh, because they are meaningful and impactful and and you know I, I think most of us are here to you know make a difference and and to really you know. Uh, you know, make progress in our respective fields of science, and um, yes. it does get tough. And 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 I guess my thought is that there was there was a point in time when I was given a huge stretch role in assignment, and I had a one year old and a three year old, uh, and and a husband who's at, on faculty at UC San Francisco, very busy <laughs> time, mm-hmm. and I wasn't yes. quite sure how I was going to pull it together. And I'd always done it really by heroic brute force, uh, <laughs> or you know, just putting more hours. But at some point, you can't just put in more hours, so. Um, some terrific advice that I got was, uh, you know, certainly prioritize. And we touched on that a little bit. You know, what are you going to do, but what are you not going to do, right? What are you going to eliminate? Right. And have that conversation. Uh, but also, if you can, I know that not everyone's in the same situation, but if you can, delegate, outsource, or eliminate, right? So, right. you know, if you have a team, whether it's just colleagues or people who directly report to you, you know, how, are you, how are you going to build your team up so you can delegate? It's 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 powerful to think about how you're going to amplify your own effect. At some point, I think the crossing that gap to being an individual contributor to a leader is really about how am I going to lead and work through others. It's a very powerful concept. I think the other one, and maybe this is more on the personal front, is if if you if one does have kids, and and assuming you know my my uh, you know husband partner is 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 terrific, and and we've always you sort of balance or split things. But at some point, even two people can't quite do it, right? So right. You know, how are we going to outsource? And um, I know this can't happen for everyone, but we really prioritize even our finances. You know, we're going to really, you know, double down on child care. We're not going right. to buy new cars or, or move our house or we're going to continue renting. Whatever the choices are, those are so personal, I know. Right. But uh, for us, yeah, no, is best, best flexible child care was a huge investment for mm-hmm. us, for us to do what right. we wanted to do professionally. Yeah, and I and that's that's when I was ideas. saying before too that the the super parenting uh, sort of myth that's grown up in our culture, which puts still puts the it's almost like a 1950s burden yeah. on on mothers that um, you know those a lot of that really is not necessary to raise a healthy child who loves you. Um, right. You know, and and that right. some of that can really be done away with. Yeah. Well, let me shift from sort of what might be more of you in in industry side to questions coming in from the academic side as well. If you're coming, or maybe even pre-making that decision, if you're interviewing for postdoc positions and most of the interviewing group is composed mostly of men, any specific advice for women scientists in, in maneuvering the interview process of, you know, ways to handle um, asking questions you want to ask or being heard? Okay, I'll I'll take a stab at this one this end again. Um I okay, so interviews with men. So, you know, I probably the advice I would give whether it's men or women, but I think just sort of making sure you don't again fall into some inadvertent uh misconceptions, I guess. I would really focus on the content of what you're going to be doing. Really use language that is um more about I'm committed, I'm focused, you know, right. what actions you would take. You know, paint a vision of where you think you you would want to do. You know, uh, it's it's a bit speculative, of course, during an interview, um, and probably you know, you know, probably you know, avoid language that's more ambiguous. And I think again, I use that for men or women, but but uh, perhaps right. uh, women, you know, men may or may not be more sensitized when you're starting to talk about hope or, you know, I'm hoping to do this, hoping to do that, rather just you know, uh, you know, I'm focused on doing, uh, you know, taking this to a certain place. Things like that. I probably yeah. One thing, yeah. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Is I think any interview situation is to think about what is the thing you're you're interviewing for, and depending again in in the case of possibly a postdoc. Okay. Well, the person you're interviewing with, in that team of people. So it's probably the faculty advisor, maybe some other postdocs. 
Well, what do they want out of that postdoc position? They probably want somebody who's going to be excellent contributor to their group, going to make their lives easier, though, right? So it's like, right. how are you going to help? And not help like, oh, I'm going to come in and, and, and take care of the group, but you're, you're going to come in, I have really good skills in writing, I have really good skills in right. my management of my projects. If there's undergraduates in the lab that I've, I've mentored undergraduates, I know how to help them. So it's sort of the idea of well, what's the dynamic of the group, the more you can know about the situation you'd be going into, the more you can think about framing your skills in a way that they can picture you as part of the group. And right. I think and it is by them, clear about Oh, that. I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and getting them excited about the work you would be doing, so you're talking science, you're talking, you know, the, the exciting things that they would want to be talking to you about if you were actually there. But I would just add that many of the graduate students that I um, advise as they're moving out into the world, I, I cannot believe how many women blatantly undercut themselves. I, I just still, it still happens, and with women that I think of as confident and savvy, and I will read the first paragraph of a letter they're writing for, for a position or um, we'll do a mock interview and they are almost saying, I don't, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I don't really have the skills for this and I'm nothing and nobody, but maybe you'll consider me. I mean, not in so many words, but almost. So yeah, I, women are still doing that. And I would just say, you know, make sure you're not one of them, that you're really focusing on all this other concrete, positive um stuff that you're going to bring to the position and, and not second-guess right. yourself and just try to, if you have to pretend to be confident, just pretend, but, but make sure you're doing that. Yeah, and I think as well, the whole, to your point, I think the idea of making sure that you have other people look at your resume, look at your cover right. letter, everything from typos to highlighting your strengths to not talking about the two things you can't do rather than the 87 things you can right. do, right? Again, for men and women, this isn't this isn't a gender-specific type of comment. Right. Um, well, let me jump over to another question which has come in. It's the whole question of skill building. And it kind of has come in in a couple different ways around, well, how important is it for scientists and engineers to have an MBA? And how important is it of serving on boards and are there ways to assess which opportunities to take advantage of? And to some extent, this whole conversation we've been having about time, priorities, and what matters, right? So I guess we have, um, I do not have an MBA. Anne has an MBA. Eileen, you do not, right? So you didn't make that decision right. either. Um, but I have served on boards. So I think it probably all of us have. So I don't know if you guys want to jump in on those subjects. But skill building and where you can get those skills and how critical they are. Sure, I'll I um I'll jump in. I don't think you I don't think anyone absolutely needs an MBA. I think it depends on what kind of areas you want to go into. Uh, I think maybe more importantly for me is uh, some of the essential skills which you can pick up during a business school. But uh, but I would say any effective leader, highly effective leader, would have their own authentic ways with these skills. So we touched on some of them. Communication, right? Eileen, I love what you said. In fact, both Eileen and Cheryl, you both said, understanding the power of your language. I think that some, maybe younger women, but also men, may not understand what you're, what you're conveying is about, what you think about yourself and, and your skills. And that's all people have. It's the data that they're picking up from you. And so I think if people are much more comfortable with how they communicate, uh, especially in person, interpersonally, there's a lot of... Um, very interesting work uh, by Amy Cuddy, also, also Deborah Grunsfield, about um, non-verbal language as well, how you hold yourself, how you speak, how you engage in and one-on-one -on -one or with small groups. And I don't think it's just about presence and style. It is more about uh, can, you, can you lead others and can you convince others. It's a lot about influencing and negotiation, which is extremely powerful. And I, I really do believe some of the best scientists and leaders whether in academia or industry, must have those skills. Those are leadership skills. You can learn some yeah. of it in, in a, um, you know, again, a business school environment, but a lot of it, uh, you, there's just so much out there now on the Internet, whether you go to a training, whether you just read on it and practice, but a lot of it's experiential. You have to be willing to practice. And, yeah, uh, which and is where... And, yeah, communication comes I was going to say, and I think 
that's where I think the whole idea of, you know, where do you get your skills? If you identify skills you, you believe you should have, be that things mentors have identified, sponsors have identified for you, you could certainly go and get them on an MBA, but it's a very expensive time sink that you yeah. should know why you're doing it. To just get Absolutely. those skills, maybe not to fit, right? I did not need them based on my job progression. I learned them on the ground and never went ahead and did it, but I certainly had those skills. But I urge people to understand what is it you want out of the experience and don't just go into that. But I do urge people to take on board positions, including nonprofit boards early on, because, heck, people will let you be on the strategic planning committee of a nonprofit board, and you can learn a boatload from people who have experience. And But you're not gonna, probably not going to get on Genentech's strategic planning board as a, as a junior person in the company, right, Ann? You can email me. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, right? It's an no, idea. But I, I absolutely agree. That's actually how I learned. I learned on nonprofit, yeah. uh, whether it's boards or even just committees. I, I joined yep. uh, different committees because I was just very interested in the mission. But you just learn so many skills that way. I'd say communication, also decision-making, uh, just, just understanding both the technical and organizational parts of decision-making. By technical, I mean uh, just probability, what my scenarios are, what are my choices, that's really those are extremely important if you're going to be a great decision maker and I think really any organization academic government uh, industry really need great decision makers that's the technical part yep. of it the organizational part is back to how do I influence and how do I read what people find valuable and how do, how do we find a way that leads to something to an agreement so that we can take action together those are those are being a great decision maker or learning how to make decisions is extremely powerful for any leader Yep, no, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. And so I have one last question, though, Anne. If you could give us, we had a question come in about advice for organizations looking to enhance the diversity of their teams. Where would you encourage folks to go and look um, to find, um, you know, some, some ideas about helping them? Sure. I, I'm just going to uh, rattle off three. One is, I must say, awis.org. We have incredible book resources about uh, solutions for STEM workforce. We have uh, publications, magazine publications, research articles, um, and also uh, webinars. Uh, another area, which I just came back from the conference, is um, Fortune magazine has uh, their most powerful women resources, an incredible source of resources for uh, leaders. And also, I'm a big fan of Sylvia Ann Hewlett, who uh, runs the Center for Talent Innovation, and she has, uh, she's well known uh, to write a lot of articles about leadership as well. So I hope those are helpful resources. And no, I great. would just throw in yep. for academia, um, similar, the Advanced Stride program, uh, government-sponsored, I think Abigail Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, at University of Michigan, where I am, and Virginia Vallian, who's at uh, Hunter um, they're doing some excellent work. They're going to be coming out with a book, too, that's for more encouraging diverse, diversity in academic, uh, especially science departments. Excellent. We know what we'll do, um, if, if the two of you wouldn't mind. We'll grab the references from you guys offline and, again, post them up with our slides. Would that be okay to make sure we've, we've got as much help out there for folks? Sure. That would be terrific. Happy to. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, both of you, Anne and Eileen, for joining us today. If I had the uh, the automated applause button, I'm sure I would be able to uh, to rattle it in from uh, from the attendees on this. Um, and thank you to everybody who's tuned in. Um, really, um, a great conversation to kick off this inaugural webinar series. Um, I'd really encourage folks. This is intended to be helpful to you. And we've seen through the questions come in some themes I think we could act on. But if you have a specific topic or speaker suggestion for a future uh, Women in Energy webinar, please email it. Um, on your screen now, you'll see an email address that um, you can send some ideas in or a specific speaker you'd love to hear. I'd also encourage everyone to visit uh, both the AWIS website but also the RPE website um, and sign up for the monthly RPE newsletter to stay informed of future RPE University events, including uh, Women in Energy events. And um, as you probably also noticed, um, one of the RPE pieces we do is our summit in, um, in February. We will be hosting our third annual Women in Energy Networking Breakfast. And um, I'll be joined, I'm sure, by a 
just delightful assortment of senior level women from academia and industry. Uh, last year we had a couple hundred folks show up for that, um, men and women actually, um, because people are interested in making the, um, the best teams, forming the best teams that they can and recognize that, you know, networking at that type of event makes a big difference in who they know and expands their, um, their network. So please um, give us feedback, give us suggestions, and uh, look forward to uh, speaking with all of you as I'm out in the field and uh, engaging with you on future webinars. So again, Anne and Eileen, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.